Good morning. Well, it's a brisk 29 degrees here in a beautiful downtown Tariffville. We had a lovely but frosty uh, early morning service outdoors at 8. Uh, and so now we are so glad that you are worshiping with, up this, with, with us this morning. And so just to kind of help us get focused, uh, let's just take a moment uh, to prepare our hearts and to center ourselves on the Lord so that we can worship the Lord wherever you are, kitchen, uh, bedroom, living room, wherever you are, let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord, okay? All right, so let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, we ask. Come Holy Spirit of God and fill each of our hearts, whether we're here in this building or at home, Fill each heart with your spirit of life. Help us, Lord, with the distractions, to lay those as things aside. Protect us from all the ways the enemies would pull us off from focusing on you. And give us the gift of worship this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm Father Taylor Albright, and it's my pleasure to say to you, if you're here this morning with great thanksgiving in your heart for all that God's doing in your life, or if you're here today because you're seeking faith, or if you're here today because you're in need of hope, then this, this is your table, and we're glad you're here. So we're going to begin our worship this morning with a great song, Until That Day Comes. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. And so now let us pray today uh, the collect for this Sunday, saying together, Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And our service continues with the readings. The first reading is from the book of Zephaniah. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest there complacently on their dregs, those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The warriors cry aloud there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness a day of trumpet, blast, and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring such distress upon people that they shall walk like the blind. Because they have sinned against the Lord, their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold 
will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his passion, the whole earth shall be consumed. For a full, a terrible end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in praying the psalm together. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land, and the earth were born, from age to age you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O child of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the, in the night. You sweep us away like a dream. We fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. For we consume away in your displeasure. We are afraid because of your wrathful indignation. Our iniquities you have set before you and our secret sins in the light of your countenance. When you are angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The span of our life is 70 years, perhaps in strength even 80. Yet the sum of them is but labor and sorrow, for they pass away quickly and we are gone. Who regards the power of your wrath? Who rightly fears your indignation? So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you all are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the city, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. In the last days before Jesus' betrayal and his passion and the cross, uh, his disciples asked him questions about the day of the Lord that we've been hearing about in the scriptures so far. When will it happen? And if it involves your return, when will that be and how will we know? And so Jesus made a few comments. He, he told them, as Paul said, that the day is coming, it'll be like a thief, it, it comes at night. If the homeowner had known the time the thief would coming, he would have stayed awake. So you have to be ready. And then he told them two parables about being ready. And the fact that although the day is certain and sure, you don't know when it's going to occur. And so you have to live with an awareness and be ready. And so he told the story of an unfaithful servant who, although put in control of his master's uh, goods and all of his stuff, he wasn't ready when the master returned. He was focused on his own life and was having a big dinner for, for himself and his friends. 
Then he told the story of the 10 bridesmaids. That's the one we heard last week, where the young women were out there waiting at night to, to greet the groom and to bring him into the bride. And as they fell asleep and then awoke uh, to see him come, only five of them had oil, and as I say, batteries in their uh, flashlights. The other five had to go to CVS, get new batteries. And by the time they got back, the door was locked and they were excluded. So he, has to, he said, you have to be prepared. And then he told a different kind of parable. That's the one we're gonna hear this morning. It's a parable that's more than just readiness. It's a parable about being accountable in what we will do when Jesus returns and what we'll have to talk about with him when we see him face to face. And so now, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven will be as when a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who received the five talents went off and at once traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents handed over, uh, came forward bringing five more talents saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful, trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked and lazy slave. You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So if you've been following along with us, you will know that we have been preparing our, our hearts to, to make that prayerful decision about our pledge. And this year we're giving towards something very specific our thankfulness to God for the gift of this community here at Trinity Church. 
And so as I was thinking about that, and as we were considering, you know, what's, what are some other great stories? And I was thinking about this gospel. Uh, something came up this past week where last Tuesday, some buses that were down in New Britain, part of Datco Company, because of the way that God works in the lives of people, ended up in Kafanchan, Nigeria, a highly almost impossible story, but it made, was made possible by the work of God and by people who saw that their lives were really focused on their gifts and how they could offer them to the Lord. And so today, I wanna to show you an interview I did a little bit earlier this week with uh, Bob and Elaine Shagnon, which talks about that. So have a listen to this great interview. Hi, so we're here this morning today with Bob and Elaine Shagnon, uh, guys who you, you may or may not know, uh, longtime members here at Trinity. And I'm talking to them today a little bit about something that happened this week. If you don't know, last Tuesday, this miraculous story took place where two 26-seat buses, uh, formerly from Datco Transportation out of New Britain, and they arrived at exactly where they needed to be in Kafanchan. And uh, you can see from these pictures that this wasn't with just like two buses arriving, and like, oh, we have the buses are here. This was like like a, like a, like a citywide, like a region-wide uh, celebration because there was no way anyone ever imagined that they could get a hold of these buses. This story is a fantastic story, it's miraculous, but at the, at the heart of the story is something about our community here at Trinity, and that is the way uh, that God is at work in our community and actually transforms lives. So Bob, just like in a, in a minute, could you just explain like how is it, like how are you connected to somehow buses uh, that got to uh, Kaufman John? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm retired. I retired last September and, uh, you know, last 11 years of my career, I worked for DATCO Transportation. So uh, that was my connection to being able to source buses. Um, and, and basically, you know, the reason I did it was because I listened to the, the bishop looking for a need for buses and put two and two together. So, so on one level, it kind of sounds like, oh, here's a guy that knew about buses and a bishop made a request, but there's so much more to this story. So just tell me, like, when did you guys uh, come to Trinity? How did you guys get to Trinity? And how did things change for you after you got here? Um, we arrived in Trinity at Trinity in 2000, and our daughter had been on an Emmaus weekend, invited by another Trinity member, and came back from that weekend changed. And she actually bugged us for almost a year to come to Trinity because it was different. She felt different there. And so to kind of shut her up, we um, <laughs> said, okay, we'll just go. And we went to one service and um, never look back. It was just such a rich service and with the music and drew us in. And that was, that was the Holy Spirit, I'm convinced. So tell us a little more about your experience of like after you came, you know, like how do you go from a person who's, who's been fairly regular at mass on Sundays to coming into a church situation where suddenly you're actually feeling led by God to do things like connect buses and start schools in or some region in Nigeria you've never heard of before. So tell us, like, what was the process? Well, I think initially, um, you know, we went to that that first Sunday service. And um, as Elaine said, it, it was different. It was, a, it was a different experience for us. After the service, you know, people said, oh, remember, there's coffee hour. So, you know, it was a genuine warmness and, and uh, a genuine, you know, they wanted us to feel a part of that so, community. So what else was part of the, the experience that really kind of helped you see God in a, in a, and experience God in a different way? I, um, I was a teacher at the time and I was teaching with um, <clears throat> Kathy Sutton and we were in the same building and we shared students and 
gradually we began to talk about the church experience and it was almost like there was some mentoring going on there and um, she kind of took me under her wing and we talked about school but then we started to pray together during the day and that just kind of took us you know I talked to Bob about it and it, it took us to the next level of well, let me just interrupt you there for a second so okay. so in otherwise before then had you ever thought like oh it's lunchtime I'll get together and pray with someone was that even something <laughs> no it's like I have 25 minutes for lunch I'm taking the whole 25 minutes <laughs> so, so, so obviously it was more than just an obligation to prayer like let us say our prayers but somehow there was some reason and you felt like did you guys both kind of suddenly go from God as it, seeing God in one way to seeing God as closer or more involved in your lives it's, it's hard to explain. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't think there's an easy way to explain it. it it's um, for for me, my my contact was um, I think one of the first things that happened after we were at Trinity. That was when they were going through the the major rebuilding of the facility. Uh, so we walked in the first week, and and probably oh within six months that building was torn open wide wide open. They were adding a school addition. Well, at that point, Hap Osborne had come to our house for the, the fundraising for that. And, and that was the first real, real, real personal contact. You know, we had the, the contacts at church, but, but Hap came and, and was looking, you know, to see, you know, how we were doing, number one, you know, we're happy in the church. And he, at that time, he, he actually said to us, what else do you want to do? And I remember, you know, that, that day we, we said, we would love to be a member of an Emmaus team. Well, you know what? Two months later, Rose Hatzel <laughs> is is the uh, leader at that point for the next group, and we get asked to be on a team. So that that was the beginning of, of you know that that right. sense and, and, of really. And so for it. people for people that don't know, uh, it was interesting because you the, you started by saying my daughter went on an Emmaus weekend. She came back changed. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, there were periods of my daughter's life where I would have loved her to go anywhere for a weekend and come back to change. <laughs> but that's a whole other question. But your, daughter somehow, those too. but your daughter somehow a relationship with God and the way she saw the world and her life was different. Mm -hmm. And so then you got involved in a team. And that's a big commitment. That's Friday nights, 10 of them, you know, mm -hmm. for three hours a night. And people are worshiping and, uh, and singing and praying and organizing and preparing to talk and praying for kids you've never met before mm -hmm. and then to put on that weekend so that's like that's, i mean a 10-week commitment plus a weekend it's a pretty big deal but but as you can see and i'm sure other folks who have been done that before here because there have been like nearly 60 of them at this point but it's very right. it transforms lives and it's not the weekend it's the weekend provides the context for the community mm -hmm. in which god shows up Right, people's lives are changed. So you became part of that, and I'm sure there's some other uh, transformational pieces. Real quick, how did you end up going to Nigeria the first time? Um, our daughter had been on a mission trip during college, um, and the opportunity came up. There was a trip being planned to Nigeria, and she said, you have to go. You cannot miss this opportunity. Um, and that was it. We went, oh, she was right about the other thing. She must be right about this too. So we said, okay. Yeah, and, and at that point also, um, Kateri started around 2003. In 2000, early 2004, they were, lo they were looking for somebody to be their treasurer. So that that was where I fit into Kateri, and and, it, uh, and because because that's what you do, you're you're you were an accountant. I'm an so. accountant, yeah. You know? So so you know they asked me if I would do that, and you know I had been on the committee for two years, and and I, I looked at Elaine and I said I, I think it's probably time we do make a trip, you know, or I think I actually said I'm going. Do you want to go too? <laughs> <laughs> right, and so so when we we have spoken in the past about this, it wasn't just like uh, there was a bulletin board and you know you could sign up for like, hey, there's mission trips coming. Mm -hmm. This was the community was taking trips, beginning to take trips pretty regularly, mm -hmm. and it was just part of the community life that God's doing something in Nigeria. We need to get people involved, and where where is God calling you? Mm -hmm. and so and so it's just amazing I, I'm still blown away by when uh, Bishop John came uh, and he's involved not with the clinics in Kateri but with the schools and Bishop came it's, I still remember him very matter-of-factly saying but well, we don't call her Elaine 
uh, in Nigeria. We call her uh, Mama Graceland, and the school is called Graceland. And, and to think that, that in a, on a different continent, you would be known and have an identity that's connected with the work that God has done in your life. To me, it's just a fantastic story about uh, regular people who are just trying to do you know, life and you kind of get through week to week, and it would be nice to have a nice church, and my daughter could be there, and this could be good. But over a period of time, God got involved through different groups, through prayer, through, through serving, and just continue to invite you along so that it's a pretty common thing now for you to say, I think Lord God is leading us. You know, I mean, I mean, in uh, in 1999, if I'd have said, "How is God leading you?" I'm not sure that you would have. You might have, would not have gotten that answer. No. <laughs> is that a trick question? What does that mean? <laughs> and and still, you, you, so anyway, I think it's a fantastic story because it becomes a matter of fact thing when Bishop Dogo is sitting and saying, "Well, we could really use buses," and you're like, "I know about buses." <laughs> And the next thing you know, they miraculously are on a boat out of the Bronx, get across safely, get stored uh, and kept carefully because of all that was going on in Lagos at the time. And then somehow the buses and those five containers arrived in Kafenshan to create such a sense of gratitude uh, from those people, of just revolutionary of, and, and celebration. People marching, but all close. It's just a fantastic story. And so I it's just, a great story, but it, but it's also it, it's not just us. I mean, we had we had a lot of people along the way that helped us with this, whether it be financially or logistically, and um, we just we had a lot of support. And very appreciative. But, and, and so God brings all these like links together to create this, you know, to, to help and see see all that work get done, even as far away as Compton. So. Anyway, so thank you guys for speaking today. It's just another story of why we are so thankful for the gift, what God has done and continues to do in our community here at Trinity Carrico. So thanks, guys. And uh, I got to go uh, get out of my house right now and put on a robe and get back to the church service. Hey, I'll, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks. Thank you. God bless. So here's a, here's a funny thing, at least from, from my standpoint, about the interview. What I could see as a person who's newer to the community, that the story of the buses was, was actually not as big of a deal as the story of God's transformation of the Shagnon family, of how they arrived one day in 1999. And by 2019, when this bus story begins, they don't even see it as a very big deal. It's just what we do. We have certain gifts. We have uh, uh, gifts of connected to the bus. We have gifts of uh, we're connected now to Nigeria. And it's just what we do. We just kind of do this. We, we give our lives and our time, our finances, whatever we have, we give that over to God. And did you see like the pictures of the school kids in their purple outfits? Just the whole town was just celebrating that. I had the hardest time trying to you know, get them to tell me of these great moments of trans transformation or God did a miraculous thing because they just saw it as, a, as a, something that happened. It just the transformation. What happens is, is that a family shows up. They're just, they were just looking to somehow keep their daughter from driving them crazy, maybe to find a new church. But over time, they get invited in. They meet a person. It becomes more of a community to them. They get involved. And at the whole time, God is working in their prayer lives and in their thoughts through the scriptures, through worship, through their volunteering, such that they're, all of their life is now moving toward one thing, and that is uh, all of life is a gift from God. And how can we invest it back? And then for that one thing that we will all say one day when we stand before him, that uh, we'll say, Lord, here's the life that you gave us and all the gifts. And hopefully uh, we've been able to, to expand on what you've done in us and we give it back to you. And to hear the Lord say, ah, John, Melanie, you know, Kathy, oh, what a great job you've done. What a great job you've done. Enter into my joy. So, you know, it just, it's just a transformational piece that they hardly noticed was happening. 
But think, look at the result of it. An accountant in New Britain needs buses for people that could not afford them in Nigeria. And that story has a lot to do with what this parable was about. This parable of there's two get ready parables and then there's this, this is what will happen for you on the day that he returns. It's the story of like a ridiculously generous and gracious master who says to his slaves, each one, each of you, I'm giving you, a, according to what you can do, a different kinds of gifts. And I'm going to go away, and I want you to manage these for me. And uh, for the guy that had five of these talents, one talent, you have to understand, one talent, a talent is a measure of something like silver or gold. And uh, one talent was the equivalent of somewhere between 20 and 40 years of work you know, 24 years of salary. So one talent is a mega amount of money. In today's equivalents, it might be worth in the millions. So he gives one guy the equivalent of five million, another guy two, and another guy one. And to each of them, he says, I'm, I'm giving this to you. I mean, just think about that. The value, now kind of unrestricted management to figure out ways to get creative, to find ways to see if you can make that grow. And of course, in those days, uh, there's no stock exchange, right? So they didn't take those talents and, you know, call up their broker and get on the phone and see what was happening and, you know, invest that way. Uh, it's an agricultural economy with a growing trade, but largely agricultural. So how do you make five talents, that, that equivalent of that amount of wealth, how do you make that grow? You have to invest it in somebody's farm. You have to invest it in somebody's business. You have to get down with people and you work with them and you use this wealth to see their stuff expand so that it goes to your master's benefit. His influence, his wealth expands throughout the community. So think about that. He just isn't the only winner. Everybody wins because of the investment. And what Jesus is saying is that upon his return, uh, he is going to sit down with each of us and each of us will be, he'll say, so tell me, what did you do with the gift of life that I gave you? Tell me the story. Tell me your story of how you somehow spread that and multiplied the effect of my love and care for people around you. How did you invest your life in your gifts and abilities even your finances, how did you invest that so that it spread out into the community? Tell me the story. And so as in the story, here's what also would have been very surprising to the first listeners, is when the first guy came and said, you gave me five talents worth of wealth, and I doubled it. That's, that's what he was asked to do. That was the expectation of the master to the slave. But do you see the way the master is? He doesn't say, thanks, check, send in the next guy. No, he says, well done. Well done, my good and trustworthy servant. Well done. That would have been enough. But he says, now come and enter into the celebration. Enter into the joy that I have at my return and all that what you have done is meant. That person who thought, I'm just doing what you asked me to do, gets welcomed in. Second person, same thing. Now, the master doesn't say, well, the first guy had 10. You've only doubled to four. No, no. You took what I gave you. You made the absolute greatest investment of it. And you could, according to your ability. And you invested that. And look at the return that it's yielded. Enter into my joy. Well done. The third person, is, which is the one that I think that we generally look at, because he's the guy that you know, seems to be having some issues here, when he says this to the master, I knew the kind of guy you were, you're a hard guy, and so I just did the safe thing, he's actually lying, because you've already seen in the way he gave the gift that this master was extremely generous and gracious and put a tremendous amount of trust in all of them. But instead, he's trying to cover up for the fact that he didn't do anything with the gift. And so if that was the only thing he was asked to do, here's the question, 
which I think the first hearers would have heard. What was he doing during that long period of time that the master was away? What was he working on if he wasn't working on the thing he was given to do? Well, we know he must have been working on his own agenda. Because he's a slave, everything that he has and all the resources he has, his home and his income and all that, that's all based on, that's, that's from the master. But he was focused on his world, on his agenda, on his life. And I could almost hear it if the story was updated to today, I could almost hear a well-meaning guy say, I was going to get to it, boss. I really was. But you see, I had to take care of things first. I had to work on my career and I had to work on my family life and I had to, the kids were busy. And I really thought, you know what? I'll work on all this. And then in my spare time, with my spare energy, with my spare leftover finances, and so, so he's missed the opportunity that God was giving him gifts, or you know, I guess in the parable, the, the master is giving him gifts to invest for the benefits of others, to see that the master's influence is spread out throughout the community. And that's the part that's hard, because the longer the boss stays away, we already know the easier it is to think about what will I do when he returns? And so transformation for the Shagnans, which I just watched on this monitor here, transformation went in their life. It was very simple. This is just what we do. We're here to serve the Lord. The bishop in Nigeria can't afford buses. They can't import them. I know some buses. Let's work on a plan. I'll give my time, my finances, my gift of being an accountant. I'll give you what I have in order to make that happen. For him, it was a natural thing because that's what Christian life really is all about. But, but back to this parable. Jesus is a person of history. I don't mean just that he's historic. What I mean is that he is real. He's a real person. You have a great, great, great grandmother. You never met her, but maybe if you looked her up on, in your Ancestry.com account, you, found, you know that there was this woman, this person who lived. Jesus is the, is the same, is as real as your great-great-great-grandmother. Those people who followed him at first saw him as a good teacher, then a great teacher, and then a person who did miracles, and then they came to realize that this Jesus is the very Son of God. And so what he says isn't just good advice, it's the truth. Jesus said that he would return. And on the day of his return, it would not be like the first Christmas, but it would be very different. When Jesus returns, the world as you and I know it will stop. We are not going to hear a news report, finish out our day, after dinner, check our news feed and say, oh, I heard that Jesus came back. What else happened? No. Kids will not be getting up going to school. You won't be going to work. Governments will no longer be governing. When Jesus returns, the world as we know will stop. Some have called it the day of the Lord. It's the day of resurrection. In the creed, it says he will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. On the day that Jesus returns, that will be the greatest moment of your life. The greatest moment of your life, the day that Jesus returns, because now, on that day, the Jesus who you have known and loved and prayed to from afar will be right in front of you and be present to you. And that same Jesus is going to sit down with you and in a very excited fashion is going to say to you, Jim or Mary or Caitlin, tell me, I'm excited to hear, what did you do with the gift of life that I gave you? 
Tell me what you did. Tell me how you used the gifts I gave you. And tell me the stories of how they went out into the world and touched people's lives. My guess is that you may think of some things, but that the Lord will reveal for you exactly the way that you used all of his gifts and the way that it impacted the world around you. And for those of you who gave those gifts to invest in the wider world for the love of God, and for the sake of his kingdom, and to see others' lives be touched by that, Jesus himself, the Son of God, risen from the dead, is going to look at you and say, Oh, well done. Well done. I am so impressed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now enter in to my celebration of this new kingdom. Come, have a seat. Be with me. I am so excited to celebrate with you. Whether that meant that you started a whole ministry or you moved a thousand buses or whether you helped out a person in your neighborhood or you were a caring friend, to whatever degree that God has given you these gifts, he is going to celebrate with you to the degree that he's given you these gifts. That will be the greatest day of your life. At the same time, Jesus reminds us that there's the possibility that instead of using all that God has given us in our life to see that, to, to do that for him, we can get caught up in making it about our agenda. We can say we had the gift, we held on to it, but we had to see our career get going first so that we could get a family and live in the right place. And there's so many things, you know, Lord, you know, living in the Farmington Valley and Simsbury and Avon, there's a lot of expectation on us. And we got really busy with all that. I think the greatest thing that could happen to anyone in the world, rich, poor, from wherever you're from, would be to have the affirming word of the God who has known you since before you were born say to you, well done, well done, great job. There's nothing that could be better for eternity than that. Today is a day, I believe, in which you can make an assessment where has my best time, where have my best abilities and gifts, where, have my, where has my life been invested, and to what end? And if you take a look at that assessment and you say, wow, I got caught up in other stuff, then this today is a gracious reminder of you still have a moment to turn toward the Lord and to make his approval, his well done, your goal in life and to line your entire life up with that. Because if you do, everybody wins. Your family wins, the people around you win, you win, God wins, the world wins. And so today, may the Lord remind us that we will stand before him one day and what he really yearns for is to welcome us into the celebration. And so now today, make your, make your life count. Align your life with what God has given you these gifts for, and everyone will prosper. It may not be buses. It may be a phone call. As simple as that. And so I say these words today to encourage you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Right before I do the creed, I just want to remind you that in a few minutes when the creed is over, we're going to be turning to our prayers and that during the prayers, uh, I'm going to be praying with you and I will pray some of your prayers so that we can all join together in, in your prayer need. And so please be sending in, in your chat lines, both on Facebook and Zoom, be sending in your prayer requests your request for the wider world. And Lord knows we know we need right now prayers for our country, but also for the names of those people who need God's help this morning. All right? So our service continues.
with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now I want to give you just a moment to be able to send in your prayers and your thanksgivings. Now in peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For our presiding Bishop Michael, our bishops Ian and Laura, and all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in his church. And now, let's pray together for those requests and needs that God has put upon your hearts this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray for this world that you love in this world that you have never given up on. And as this COVID virus continues to move throughout the world, we pray for your mercy. We pray for your mercy, particularly on those areas and regions where there is no real health care. We pray for refugees displaced from their homes and in refugee camps. We pray for those in nations which are struggling we pray for even the nations of the world, Lord, for all the nations of the world this morning. We pray for areas where there is unrest and violence, and we pray for the coming of your kingdom. And we ask for peace. Heavenly Father, in our own country, we pray also for peace here. Lord, in the aftermath of this election, we pray for peace we pray for a move toward unity. We pray for helpful leadership 
that will help us put aside our differences and to unite as a country. We pray for all the areas in every state right now as the COVID virus sets new unfortunate records in every state of the nation. We pray for wisdom for those in office, for governors and mayors, and for health administrators everywhere. But we pray even for our own uh, peers and neighbors across this land, Lord, for wise judgment. Lord, we pray that our care for each other, Lord, might determine how we ourselves interact in this difficult world. Lord, we pray locally that you would continue to shield our assisted living and care facilities from the virus. We pray for all of our schools, for the administrators, teachers, staff, and students as we continue to try here in our state to have our students be together and continue on. We pray particularly for our principal here in Tarrafil, Steve Matizik. We pray for wise judgment, Lord, and direction for him. We pray for those who have been in the path of the latest hurricane, Lord, in an area where they have been literally swamped by all kinds of floods. And we pray for your mercy, Lord, and help us, Lord, to know how to help them. We pray for our friends and family members here in our church who are dealing with health crises right now. We remember all those who are going through cancer treatments in particular. We pray for our friends and family members who are in the hospital. And we continue to pray for hospitals and hospital staffs. We pray also, Lord, remembering especially all those who are isolated, particularly for those who are, need mental health care and don't receive it. We pray, Lord, that you would help us get through this unfortunate stigmatizing of mental health and addiction issues so that we might be more open, open to get help from each other, Lord, and to be able to make that public even within our own church. Lord, and we also pray for people we have people that we pray for. In this day, Lord, as we prepare to list, we pray for Bob and Dennis, for Nancy. We pray for uh, Kyle, Serena. We pray for Mark and Candy and all those who are dealing with cancer this morning, Lord. We pray for our neighbor here in Tarrafil, Terry. We pray, lift up to you, Rob. We pray for Beth and Rebecca and Armand. We pray for Ken and Angela, for Bob. And this morning, we also add to our list Maureen. We pray for Tara for Isabella and for Liz. We pray for Nancy Fossum and for Nancy Fleming, for Larry, for Lydia. We pray for Tricia, for Charles. We pray for all family members in the armed services, particularly remembered this morning, Kiem and Katie. We pray for Anne and Joe, who were recently in a car accident. We pray for Alexa. And this morning, Lord, in particular, we pray for Robert and Caroline, whose baby seems to be coming early. Uh, and so we pray for a safe birth and a healthy baby, though early we pray for a healthy birth there. So we pray for that family other prayers that you might have. Let's lift those to the Lord now. For Kelly and Dawn, for Doris and Cameron, for Ronnie, Donna, and for Alice. And I want to give you just a moment to go ahead and say out loud as a step of faith, uh, your person that you want to pray for this morning. Just take that moment.
And we say, hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. And also, Lord, we thank you for all the blessings of this life. I want you to think of one thing for which you are most thankful for this morning, just one thing, and to lift that to the Lord. There's one thing you're thankful for. We are thankful for a very positive biopsy that came back. Lord, thank you so much for your intervention. We pray for Paul Bataro's improvement. Thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for uh, a 30-year anniversary and for, at least on this uh, tablet, the best wife ever, Deborah. Congratulations to her and to Paul. We're thankful for a new day. We're thankful for uh, musicians, and Lord, I am particularly thankful for all the work, the extra work it takes for our musicians to get together to record. It is so much more difficult than it was, but thank you for them and the way they have found ways to bless us with this worship music. And we continue to pray for Elaine Shaw, and we are thankful for her strong spirit and recovery. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. And we pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We lift those names to you right now. Thank you, Lord. And we pray particularly for those families who are grieving the recent loss of family members we ask your comfort and care, particularly this morning, for Cynthia and Joyce. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. And it also with thankful hearts that we pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. And we'll say this together. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name. And now, almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now, even though it's at a distance, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Amen. Amen. And so just a, just a brief word. Uh, today would have been the day that we uh, brought our pledge cards in, in the driving them up in, in the cars to be able to have a great celebration Sunday. Unfortunately, uh, there was the, the, the one weak spot in the chain that we thought probably could happen that would make this get delayed happened. That is to say, I didn't get the letter done in time. And then when we rushed to get it in, and we got it in early on Wednesday morning, we remembered, oh, it's Veterans Day. So there was no way those cards were going to get to you by Friday and Saturday. So this week, in the next few days, you will be receiving in the mail a letter uh, describing to you, uh, again, our stewardship program that we've been talking about. We're giving out of our thankfulness uh, for God's gift of this community, and we want to see that continue. Uh, and then next Sunday, that's right, next Sunday, the 22nd, at 11 o'clock, you guys can just line on up. And whether you want to get out of the car and sit in a chair or just drive up, we want to be able to like make a connection with each other and be able to come in and present our offerings. So call it a field trip. Uh, or, may, or even if you have to, just roll your window a little bit and slide it out the window, and we'll take that from you. But we just want to be able to see you and be able to give you the, the opportunity, instead of just like sending in a letter, to be able to present that to the Lord. And we'll offer those back in the church uh, once we're all done. So now let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice unto God. <laughs> Thank you.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right in a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. 
he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us your peace. And now because we're unable to receive the holy uh, sacraments in the way that we would like, we do have this great prayer uh, from St. Alphonsus, which we can pray together. So please join me. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist. And I love you above all things. And I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually in to my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And now we continue with this prayer of thanksgiving, saying together, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, 
and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may Jesus Christ, the one who is soon to return, be so evidenced in your life this week that your lives might be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And so now let's join together in this great song, the Revelation song, a real favorite here at our church. Let's sing this together.
So thank you so much for being with us this morning. It is such a powerful uh, encouragement to all of us to know that we're all together, even though we might be distant, it is just so powerful for us to know that we're together in worshiping to this day. You have questions, you have comments, you're here for the first time, you can call me direct at the number which is probably there on the, on the website, 413-478-5367, send me a text, but let's get together and talk. If you have prayer requests, we're now beginning a whole prayer ministry where we take your requests and we pray for them during the week as well. So may God be with you this week and be careful and cautious as you go, but let's do everything to the Lord who has given us everything. So now let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.